literally blood, sweat, and tears. It was really the beginning of Hannah Oil and Gas. Mr. Hannah pretty much did this all himself. He got to where he was on his own. And I know he told me, he said, you know, uh, my company wasn't given to me. He said I started from scratch. But you could call Hannah Oil and Gas a beacon of light. There's no greater uh, feeling of accomplishment than having a family-owned business and, um, and one where your children um, are capable of assuming it and building it to even better and bigger things than what you might have been able to accomplish. That certainly has been true with Hanna Oil and Gas. Jim Hanna, when I first knew him, he was a one-man operation. I can't think of anyone that has as many friends as Jim Hanna. I mean, uh, he's just a people person, and he's been very successful at building this thing up uh, into what it is now, you know. It's, it's, it's truly an amazing story. It's, it's the uh, great American success story. Jimmy did not find the oil business. The oil business found him. When he graduated from, the, from North Texas in Denton, Texas, he was looking for a job. And he was walking down the street in uh, Wichita Falls. And he admired this fella, he wore silk suits, drove a Cadillac, drop top Cadillac, alligator boots. And, you know, this was back in the 50s. It began when he got out of college and he did not have a job. So he went down one afternoon and found a job. And it was with Breadwell Oil Company. He was in an area that was very prolific in oil and gas. So he grew up in a time in a boom town and Breadwell happened to be one of the biggest boomers in Wichita Falls. And Breadwell is one of the biggest uh, oil men in the state of Texas. He's a great big old man and he knew everything. And so Jimmy was tickled to death to be a land man. And I remember he came home and I said, what are you going to be what? He said, a land man. I said, what's that? He said, well, it's got to do something with land. I think I go out and I don't know for sure. I'll find out. So he got in the oil business right then and stayed in it about three years while we were in Texas with Bridwell. And then Bridwell sent him to Fort Smith. And they sent him up here to work on their behalf and open an office, start buying oil and gas leases, which he did. Um, he moved the family up here in 1961, <coughs> which was the year I was born. And I never heard of Fort Smith in my life. He, he didn't either. By then we had three children. So we came to Fort Smith and probably his coming to Fort Smith was the best thing that ever did, did for him. Because he was so excited to be doing what he did. And uh, he kind of took off like a rocket ship with this business for Bridwell. Just when the uh, Marcoma Basin was opening up, the discovery of the Red Oak Field in eastern Oklahoma was the big discovery. So Bridwell sent Jim up here to be their guy to start buying acreage and to learn all he could about the Arcoma Basin and more specifically the Red Oak Field. And he did that. He learned a lot about the Arcoma Basin. And, and after a period of time, he saw an opportunity. So he just kind of sprung out on his own. And I think with the blessing of Mr. Breadwell. And then he started a little company on his own. Uh, but he was 27, three kids, mortgage, and a good job. And he quit. And I always thought that was kind of interesting that with that amount of baggage, quit his job. And then he, uh, he started a little company called Arcoma Basin Royalty. He didn't start out with a silver spoon, but he was the kind that he made good decisions and made good friends and worked awful hard. And he started getting a little production and he started doing day work for people. And uh, after a period of time, things started to develop. He had the intelligence and the, and the nerve to start his own business and, and get 
uh, get it going, and that's not an easy thing to do. You gotta, you gotta get leases, you gotta get investors, you gotta uh, find the people that can drill the wells for you, and there's, there's a lot to it. Another one of his strong suits was resilience. I mean, you know, he had some bumps in the road, and uh, but he was always uh, coming back with a, uh, an optimistic attitude, and he, he was going to make things happen. And uh, he, he knew he could do it. And uh, so, you know, this, this industry, the oil and gas industry, is certainly one with peaks and valleys. And uh, he was always prepared for the valleys, and because um, he, he, he would take care of himself during the, in the company during the peak times. You sort of have to be a gambler to be in the exploration business, uh, oil and gas exploration, and there, um, there's a lot of uh, excitement uh, when you're uh, putting a drilling prospect together, and uh, I've always uh, compared it somewhat to kind of uh, looking for gold, so to speak, and you don't know whether you're gonna find it or not, really, until you drill the well. It hasn't always been what it is today. Uh, I can remember when Jim Hanna was down to drill in his last well. And if it didn't work, he was gonna have to find something else to do. I also remember a year where he supported his family by playing gin rummy. Uh, and I might add, Hanna's number one, a good gin player, but he's also lucky as he can be. Uh, but uh, it, it hasn't always been that way. Uh, the well that, that, that helped him the most, and which was gonna be the last well, is, is the Lincoln. The Lincoln came in and it was huge. It was a huge well. And uh, we all went out there and, you know, it was just, it was just so much fun to be around him when it came in. The company really started in 1972 when he drilled the Lincoln number two. And it was um, at a time in his life when uh, his marriage wasn't particularly working, his business wasn't particularly working, a lot of, a lot of things weren't working. and. Uh, and, and it's probably at a time where he really needed a well. He needed a success, and he got it. It was the biggest gas well in the state of Arkansas. And when he got that, when that, when that hit, um, it really leveraged him to a point where I think he was, in his own mind, had reached some sort of stability where he could you know, go do some other stuff. It gave him some clout, gave him some money. That to me was when he hit, you know, the financial success. He was able at that time to slowly hire geologists, hire secretary, get some help with land department and do different things to start building the company. From the point that he was on his own over at the First National Bank building, you know, it was a, a steady, gradual, um, increase in personnel, increase in office space. He was in one office and then he tore the wall down and he was in two offices and then he got another office. It seemed like he had no limitations with, uh, with drilling operations. He would attack his work with such enthusiasm and vigor because his hobby was his job. Jim was a guy who uh, who, uh, while he was all business when it came to making a deal, or, and he would uh, he would trade for the lowest dollar when he was out buying a lease, but he was always loyal to his employees uh, to the, to a fault almost. But uh, that uh, that uh, loyalty that he felt to his employees as he built this company has come back to the company in spades. I don't think he had an employee that wouldn't have laid down their life for him. His enduring legacy is that he knew how to make people feel important. 
and not just dignity and not just self-esteem. Uh, he really knew how to put you up on a pedestal and he did it with everyone. Uh, Mr. Hanna was, he was like a, a dad to me. He was like my surrogate father for me. Jim Hanna uh, was, you know, like a second dad to me. I'd have a dad downtime or something, you know, and I'd go in Hannah's office and say, you know, I've got this going on and that going on. And I had somebody that followed me to work one day and harassed me. And when I came in the next day, Mr. Hannah had called the chief of police and had police waiting and <laughs> It was, he was going to take care of me. Nobody was going to mess with me. <laughs> Probably spent more time with him than I have my own father because I came down here and worked every day with him. In 1978 and being a single mom, you know, I just drove used cars and when they'd bomb out, you know, I'd get another one and he'd say, he said to me, okay, now we got to do something about your car. He said, um, why don't you go down to the Oldsmobile dealer and look around, see if there's anything there. They might have a used car you like. And so I looked at him and I picked out this baby blue Oldsmobile Cutlass. Oh, it was just beautiful. And I went back to the office and I said, well, I found my car. And he said, what is it? And I said, it's an Oldsmobile Cutlass. It's a baby blue. He said, I don't think I can afford that. Let's go down and look. And he had already called him and told him to get it ready that I was driving out of there. <laughs> and so he said, let's, let's just go down there and look. So we went there and walked in and they said, here's your keys to your car. I just probably cried, I don't remember. And I looked at him and he said, it's yours. And so then we got back to the office and he started thinking, now how am I going to justify this with everybody else? <laughs> and he thought about that. He was so excited about buying this car for me. And uh, so then he decided that it was going to have to be a company car. I went to work for Mr. Hanna in October of 1980. We were a very small company, less than 12 people working for us. We were in the First National Bank building and we had several offices in there. Uh, there were two people in the accounting department, uh, Mr. Hanna, myself, and then we had several people in the land department, Bill England, Wanda Anderson. Everybody worked, they worked hard. No, they didn't uh, slack off on the work, but uh, they did it because they respected Hanna. And uh, you respected him while he did you, so. Everybody had to do at least his job and then maybe 10 percent more, you know. And, and everybody had to do whatever needed to be done. He expected you to work hard, and um, I know a few times I would say something to him about being overloaded, and he would just look at me and say, well, you have to come in on a Saturday then, I guess. That was what he expected. But we all worked hard, and he took good care of us. It was a very small operation then. Uh, but we started drilling wells right away it's, and we were drilling a well a month I think it was it was exciting it was scary he started drilling more wells and we'd all go out to the wells and we'd all get excited you know and see the gas wells come in we had a party every time one was successful he would call me in the middle of the night and say, we've got another one. <laughs> it was like babies were being born. I remember the first well that he drilled that I was here for, and that was the Cottrell well in Crawford County. He called me late, late at night. He was so excited. One of our wells down south that was right on Highway 22 had come in, and it had come in pretty big. and. The fire, you could see the glow in the sky from Fort Smith, but the well was all the way down near County Line, I think, past Charleston. So we all had to drive down in the middle of the night and see it. Hannah had, uh, he drilled a lot of his early wells on what he called closeology. 
That is, one drills as close to existing wells as one can, and that worked very, very well for him. He was very successful in his success ratio. The secret to a successful oil and gas company is the price you get for that gas. If you drill a well, and that costs you $300,000 to drill that well, and you get gas, and you get a sufficient amount of gas to where you can tell you can sell it for the going price, then you can make money. And that is one of the keys to it still. We produce a commodity, and so we can compete really just one way ultimately, and that is on the cost of our product. Uh, we can't control our revenue, we can control our costs overall. And if our, the cost of our product is too high, we go out of business. If it, the cost of our product's low enough, then we get to grow. They've, they've lived well within their means, but um, they've grown now to the point where they've, uh, they've got such capable people, extremely capable in all the key areas, land, geology, engineering, top management. We kind of understand uh, what our strengths are. And our core strength is finding natural gas in the Arcon Basin. And I think this is what our company does. We, we drill holes in the ground. And, um, uh, you know, I can't do this without everybody else. And they, they can't do it without me. It's a big team operation. And uh, we don't consider anybody at hand any more important than the next guy. Uh, but this is what we do. We drill holes in the ground looking for natural gas. For the exploration side, the most successful part of this business is that we don't necessarily concentrate on having the most wells and having the best production. We concentrate on getting the most we can out of each well. Generally, it starts out with the geology. The geologists understand the, the prospect and develop the prospect. As a petroleum geologist, I uh, basically try to find where we're going to drill for, for oil and gas. Uh, try to uh, look at all the subsurface data and, and surface data and, and uh, develop what we call a prospect. It's The geologist really comes up with the idea. I lay the um, economic template over that idea um, to see if it warrants uh, drilling and, um, and then we go from there. Basically the geologist will come up with their prospect and they'll pick a pick a spot and basically say you know geologically I think this is the best spot to drill the well and then at that point of course we hope that, that if we don't have all the oil and gas leased everything leased at that time then you know we go to try to secure the oil and gas leases in that particular unit but uh, once we do that then you know I'll go see who owns the surface of that tract and then would go out and have that you know survey to see exactly where it's located on the surface and then go negotiate with that surface owner uh, to drill that well. And at that point the engineers get involved with planning the well to drill and test the prospect. The trick is to make sure that that what you're chasing when you risk it that it's worth chasing for that amount of money. So it's being realistic on what your cost structure is uh, the risk and then the size of the reward that you're chasing. When the, the uh, geologists decide where we're going to drill and the landmen go lease the land and the engineer comes up with a plan, then I come in with iron and drill the well. You know, when I come in, uh, we, we'll drill the well bore, we'll set casing to a certain depth, and then I take the rig and go on to the next one. When I get that route, then you know I'll go back and do the same thing over again, figure out who owns the surface between that well back to that pipeline, negotiate a route to lay a pipeline in there to hook that well up. Typically, I think we're probably drilling uh, a dry hole out of every 10, and, and of the rest of them, uh, six or seven of them are maybe break even deals at the best. You're looking for that, you know, that one or two good ones in, out of 10. So, uh, in a certain area, especially in Arkansas, you just have to punch a lot of holes in the ground. Uh, when you get down in this field, uh, they're allowing you to drill one well per 40 acres in some places, one per 80. And you can drill a well right here and scoot over at the other side of this location, drill a well, and it might turn out completely different. 
that's how fast the rock changes here in this, this part of Arkansas. The faults are critical in the Arkansas Basin. There's a lot of traps up against the faults. Gas and oil migrate to the highs. So the traps uh, that the fault, a fault uh, breaks the surface of the rocks. And so uh, a lot of times they'll serve as a trap, an updip barrier to the uh, migration of the gas. So they'll, the gas will end up migrating up dip right up to the point of the fault and then fill, fill from there down to a certain point. So you'll have gas trapped in the rocks up against the fault. We're lucky with natural gas is, is that the, because of the, the compression, the natural compression of the, the overburden of the earth, it, it's under pressure. And so when you drill into it, uh, it can have anywhere from 400 pounds to 2,500 pounds of pressure. And so it will, it will flow to the surface naturally, just like if you poke a nail in, in, a, in a tire. Uh, it will try to escape and come to the surface. And so by using the, the, uh, the steel casing uh, method and tubing, we can trap that and then we can control that at the surface and then treat that gas and get it into a pipeline. When we're on air, you've got immediate feedback. It's basically a drill stem test. Uh, we're returning the air. We're pumping the air down the middle of the drill pipe, back up the outside of the drill pipe in the well bore, and it'll bring your cuttings and, and, the, and of course, the air back out. It goes out this line that you see out to the reserve pit. That's called the Bluey line. We keep a, a, a pilot light lit out there, and when gas comes back, it'll ignite that gas, and you'll have a big, pretty fire out there. So that's how you tell when you're on air. Uh, when you're on mud, it's a little bit tougher. You got, you, you know, you've got that thing balanced or overbalanced in some cases. So sometimes you don't see it when you're drilling on mud or fluid, and you have to do your logging and your testing to see if you, you've got some down there. On air, it's immediate feedback. Once the well is drilled and completed in that rig and completion, all that's out. Um, then I'll come back in and restore and reclaim that site. And um, at that point, then also the engineering will uh, determine which is the best route, if, it, if the well's productive, what's the best route to lay a pipeline. The geologists, um, they find the gas, the engineers, bring it, um, hopefully drill a well and make a well and bring the product, make production. And my job is to take the, um, make, find a home for the production, to, um, to um, find out what pipeline is closest and contact the pipeline and say we've got gas and um, make arrangements. We have gathering agreements with different pipelines so I um, make sure that you know, they know the gas is coming and then find a market for it, you know, find someone that actually, you know, a market that wants to buy the gas and put a dollar value to the gas. I do measurement from the wells itself, uh, production automation, data acquisition from the wells, actually taking the data from the gas well, we bring it to, to the office and it's displayed on the web page, on a web page for everyone uh, in the company to look at. This is kind of the payoff for a year's worth of hard work. We all work to, together uh, a lot of times start to finish. If I go out and look at a, at a uh, uh, at some surface outcrops and, and start talking about a prospect, you know, I may start talking with the land guys at that point uh, about, you know, what's the lease situation out here. Uh, start talking with the, uh, with the engineers about what might be involved in, in the drilling at that particular location. If we're, if we're looking at a shallow well or a deep well, you know, what that's going to involve. So really from the get-go, we're all, we're all interfaced together. From start to finish, uh, when there's a success, everybody celebrates. When there's a failure, when there's a dry hoe, everybody's down because everybody had a piece of that. And uh, so it's that teamwork kind of experience. The thing that the Hanna family has always emphasized is let's be true to some fundamental values things that we appreciate in other people and in other companies. Let's, let's set the standard. They're not simple standards, but they're, they're basically formed around the idea of respect and integrity. When you're leasing land from people, uh, you, you have to uh, have the ability to communicate with people and you have to have uh, people that trust you to take their lease and, and explore uh, on their property or, or property where they would be joined in what we call a drilling unit. 
Since I was a girl, I've been told how, how the oil and gas companies took advantage of the landowners. So I was a leery when Mr. Hanna wrote me a letter or sent me a statement saying they were going to drill. Well, early on, they sent me some papers that I didn't quite understand. So I called down here to Hannah after uh, I got off from work and it was late. So I guess everybody had gone home but Mr. Hannah. So I was just telling him how I wasn't about to put up with that. Now I didn't understand, I wasn't gonna sign it and all that. And he said something to me that I shall never forget. He said, Miss Riley, I am not going to cheat you. And in all these nearly 30 years, he has never cheated me. He's been totally honest with me. I think a big uh, reason that our business has been successful is because our relationship with those landowners. I like to think that the people that we lease and the landowners that we have our well locations on or whatever are our partners, our friends. We go the extra mile to try to make sure that whoever we're doing business with, we can go back and do business with again. I first started participating in one or two wells a year with him, small amount, nothing big. And uh, it, it worked out pretty well over the years. Uh, and Hannah's operation was pretty successful. I've always found him to be honest and above board, so. It helped me build my new house. It helped me make a, have a concrete driveway put down to my house. It helped me to buy stocks and bonds. It's helped me, um, well, it's just helped me. I can be, drove a better car than I did before. Yes, it's helped me immensely. The number one thing I think about our company is, is I love our pyramid. And at the bottom of that pyramid, we have what we call core value. Integrity, decisiveness, strong work ethic, bold optimism, and fun. As a business family, we'll be supportive and open and generous and friends. And, and I have to tell you, I, I, I stick with that because I see those core values lived out day in and day out in this company. And for 20 something years, I haven't witnessed a deviation from that. Visually, I wanted to try to get across the idea that this place is fun. I'm standing here in the shower that says it's fun. Um, also, um, bold optimism, that comes from also asking us, or wanting us, uh, uh, not uh, keeping us from thinking outside the box. So uh, we do a lot of things that are, I mean, we're, uh, don't, don't get me wrong, we're, we're oriented and we're back with a good foundation on almost everything we do. We do our homework on it. But yet, um, if you continue to look at things in the normal conventional way of looking at things, you know, it looks like everything's drilled up. And so um, if you think outside the box then, and, and we're encouraged to do that, um, then you all of a sudden, what looks like is a, you know, one man's dog becomes another man's treasure. To be uh, in the exploration business, you have to be, you have to have optimism, you have to be optimistic because you're, you're going to drill some dry holes. I mean, contrary to what a lot of people in the public think, you know, you don't go out and drill a producer every time you drill a well. So you have to, you have to be optimistic uh, to, to be in, in the oil and gas business. When I think of decisiveness and bold optimism and work uh, ethic, the, the first thing I think about always is our exploration team and just the, the knowledge and the courage and the camaraderie that we have together. We opened our Canadian office at a time when prices were greatly depressed. I mean, our industry had, had done this, and we were at, moving towards a very harsh uh, low for several years, and that's when Jim Hanna and Bill Hanna purposed to open our Canadian office, which thrives to this day. Bill Hanna went up to Canada in the uh, kind of mid-80s and uh, opened an office up there at a time when uh, there really that wasn't that much business uh, up in Canada. Things had slowed down quite a bit. Uh, he ended up in a, in a, I think, a quite brilliant move, uh, put together a group of people uh, in one office area that he didn't have to pay for. But there were geologists, engineers, geophysicists, land guys that uh, he ended up renting space to and had ended up having kind of uh, 
a, uh, a good oil and gas group uh, team that he could uh, then go to and, and ask them about things. The Canadian operation mirrors in, in many ways this operation. That is, it started out as a lease play here uh, when Jim came up here with Bridwell Oil uh, from, uh, from Wichita Falls. That started as a lease play when Bill Hanna went up there from here to open that, that office. Uh, it, in both cases, the pace uh, is, is a gradual development that probably at the time seems very slow, but as you reflect back, has seemed pretty rapid. The company is something for this community to really be proud of. It's started from the bottom and has built into a good company with just tremendous relationships with its employees and with the community. People that uh, are proud of their association with Hanno Oil & Gas and who in turn make it a very proud company and a very successful company. I just can't believe really the, the atmosphere here. It's a very nice place to work. We just have fun things that we do together that continues the bind of the business family that we have. This, this whole atmosphere in this office is um, not just co-worker, but kind of like an extra brother or sister. I've got two families, uh, and I don't really um, place one higher than the other. Uh, I've got my family family, and I've got my Hannah family, and um, my Hannah family's every bit as important to me as my family. It's a good place to work. I worked, up, <clears throat> worked here for him for 10 years, and it seemed like as time went by and only about seven or eight years that cause it is a good place to work. All you have to do is look at the turnover ratio. People are happy at Hanno Oil and Gas and they're not leaving and, and there's a reason for that. I hear people sometimes say, you know, they really seem sincere. Well, they don't seem sincere. They are sincere. And that really comes through when you work here. If I needed to know something about anything in the oil and gas business or business or life in general, there's somebody in this office that I could walk to and I could, you know, I could get some good advice or some good information on. So uh, there's not many places that you can go and, and have that. If you want to work for this company, any company, uh, you've got to bring something unique to the table. Uh, experience, education, uh, I think, I think that's what makes any of these companies is individuals. We hire people that kind of manage themselves so you don't have to manage them. The company is probably uh, most noteworthy to me from an employee, employer perspective because of the lack of formality. Uh, you won't find a policy book uh, here. You got to be a self-motivator. Uh, kind of manage yourself in this company. We always have been that way and if, if you're not a self-motivated, self-policing person, uh, then you know you're not ever going to make it here. I think it's, uh, it's a fun business. I think it's a challenging business. I think you can see an end result and it's just like when you were a kid playing in the mud. We still do it today. We love to go get our jeans on and, and go out in the rain and, and drill a well. It's the funnest thing on earth. I'm passionate about the business uh, from the standpoint of uh, uh, it's a treasure hunt. It's it, you go out and you're digging for treasure, and it it you know that was fun when you were five years old, and it's fun when you're 50. I've watched Bill grow from a young man right out of college to just an extremely competent executive, and. Um, and that's a very rewarding thing, not only to me as a friend of the family, but I'm sure to them as a family to be able to preserve the heritage that their father started uh, and preserve the company as a family-owned entity. Bill got in and just did a tremendous job. I mean, it's, he turned a great thing into an even better thing. And uh, the, the third generation can do that if they're willing to roll up their sleeves and work. And, um, you know, Jim Hanna, and Bill Hanna have, they have surrounded themselves with good people. And that's, that's what makes Hanna work. And, and uh, if, if they'll continue that, 
keep surrounding themselves with good people, uh, they'll be fine. No matter what you do in life, you need to like what you're doing. And so, you know, I can't make somebody be a geologist uh, if that's not something that they, that they want to do. But, but if they've got an interest in science, uh, you know, geology, engineering, those type of things are, are, uh, are, are great jobs out there. You can have a lot of fun doing it and, and uh, I think there's, there's going to be more and more of a need for that. You know, I'm 50 years old and, and I'm one of the young guys left in geology in this part of the world. Or uh, family run business, it is owned by a family and um, my children do bear some responsibility for that, um, they're going to have to, you know, be aware of what goes on here. So while I'm not pushing them to, you know, join this company, I am also saying to them, you know, you, it's here and you need to come learn about it. No matter uh, what generation it is, you, you have to set a goal, you have to have a purpose, and you have to work hard uh, to achieve uh, your goals. and, and uh, uh, so that, that again, I, I just think that dedication, uh, hard work, having a passion for what you do uh, still applies in the, in the current generation and the one to come. The groundwork is here and you've got a beautiful building to work in and experienced, confident people in the, in the business. So I, I, I think uh, any future generation would be fo foolish not to take advantage of the opportunities they have. Pick one thing and do it better than anybody. I think that's the main focus here is it doesn't matter what you do in life as long as you do something. You know, I mean, wh whatever you want to be, wherever you want to become, wherever you want to go, I think you should uh, do it in respect of uh, helping, uh, bring something better to the next person. A, they need to go work, they need to get educated in whatever field they're choosing to go into. Um, B, they need to go work for somebody else and be out there working on their own. And if after those two things occur and they are um, academically prepared for some position here at this company, they certainly have a foot in the door always be in a position where you can grow. If you're everywhere you can't grow, then you're going to limit yourself, you're going to become stagnant. And I, I think over the years we've tried, you know, hard, the hard work, you know, tough negotiators, uh, good business, you know, good businessmen, uh, good families, uh, leaders, you know, they've always, we've always been thought of as well in the community. Uh, those things are all good and they're all you know, things we strive to keep. Um, you know, as, as time changes and you get the younger people in, um, you know, I think it's up to us to try to pass those, pass those things on to them and hope that they, they uh, see things the, the same way and have those same values that we have. You look around, it's a successful operation. Uh, they've, uh, they're up in Canada now. Uh, they're uh, continuing to, to drill, uh, and uh, I think that it'll, it'll be here uh, when the next generation comes to work. But those people need to understand where it started and how it got to where it was. Well, I truly enjoy the people I work with. I, I think they're a special group. Uh, they afford me a, a pretty nice, pretty nice arrangement. I get to work in a, a, a great building with great people um, in a great industry doing something that's meaningful. I mean, providing energy, that's <laughs> pretty basic and pretty important. Energy, we need, the, we need the natural gas and it's a risky business. It's a very, very risky business to be in because you don't always have payoffs. You can never tell what you're going to get when you deal with Mother Nature. And I don't know if there's anything riskier on the planet than drilling a, a well. You step up to the line, you bet your million dollars, and your return after a year of preparation, a million dollars to drill may be zero. And how many people have to make those kind of decisions and have that kind of courage 
and yet every day we do it. We do it because we believe what's on the back of our envelope, which, which is uh, providing jobs and helping meet the energy needs of North America. When you think of, of Jim's uh, entrance into Fort Smith and into the valley here where all the, the, the natural gas reserves were, uh, to come into it as uh, an employee of another company uh, buying leases and to take that and over a period of, uh, well, this is now 40 plus years later, uh, into a company the size that it is now. And Anol and Gas Company is a, uh, uh, a nice size independent oil and gas company. It has influence. It's got, it's got uh, uh, a position in this market uh, and a significant influence. But I think the nature of the company is reflected in the employees. They're, they're long term, all close to each other, all supportive. And I'm grateful to work at a company like Hanno on Gas. I love coming to work every day because um, I love the people I work with. I mean, there's, we have really good relationships here. I like what I do. I think that makes me do a better job um, because I do enjoy it. I cannot imagine a better, more people-oriented place to work. I don't know if there's any other place that you could work, that you could get the full spectrum of, of this industry and everything that goes along with it. It's a fun place to work. Everybody enjoys it. I like to come to work here. The Hanna family has built a structure fit for queens and kings, a place to work and plan and think, a place that inspiration brings. Magnetic walls will hold the maps as Hanna Oil and Gas expands. Foresight and nerve supply the means the search for oil and gas demands. A room to exercise for health, a place to exercise the mind, a room to meet and set the goals, a place that great success designed. And if one needs to rest a bit, perhaps the brain has hit a wall, what better place to just relax than by the garden waterfall? We all have dreams of things sublime, but most of us don't follow through. The Hanna family has earned this building as a dream come true. The building is a monument to all the folks who've done their part. To build a company from scratch, this castle has a soul and heart.